History has no shortage of tyrants. The emperors of ancient Rome, the monarchs of medieval Europe, and the 20th century communist and fascist heads of state are all examples of the cruelest and most callous humans who have ever seen the light of day. Worse yet, most tyrannies have gone unpunished. Theories of what is legitimate to resist tyranny have always been articulated by a variety of thinkers, but there was never a legal framework to prosecute a person for being a tyrant. Tyranny was a moral sin, but it was not a crime. This all changed in the 17th century in England, when a low-born lawyer by the name of John Cook became the first person in history to prosecute a head of state for crimes against humanity. In the 17th century, Europe was dominated by monarchs who believed that they were divinely ordained to rule over their nations. The English King James I, who reigned during the first half of Cook's life, truly believed his word was law. A famous example of his hubris occurred in 1609 in a Privy Council meeting involving Edward Coke, the champion of the common law tradition. In this meeting, James boldly asserted that he was the supreme judge above all others, and that since he appointed judges of England, he could overrule their decisions and dismiss them at a whim. Coke disagreed. He explained that the king was under God and the law. James responded to Coke's argument by lunging across the room to punch Coke in the face. Coke quickly dodged the blow and prostrated himself on the floor before the king, apologizing for even suggesting that there was any power more awesome than a king. James wrote a treatise on how to rule as a monarch for his son, Charles, in which he shows his diehard beliefs in his own divine power. He writes that the king is the absolute master of the lives and the possessions of his subjects. His acts are not open to inquiry or dispute, and no misdeeds can ever justify resistance. The king's word was law, no matter how arbitrary, no matter how cruel. This is the world John Cook lived in, but it was slowly changing. Cook was born in 1608 to a family of poor farmers living just outside a small village named Burbage. Cook's family were Puritans, a religious minority which sought to cleanse the Catholic Church of all elements of supposed ritual and superstition. They were a religious minority which is often discriminated against for their staunch beliefs. Cook's family were not wealthy by any means, and under usual circumstances, Cook would most likely remain a farmer for the rest of his life, as his father and his grandfather had been before him. Thankfully, in Oxford, a college had been founded for the poor and needy, thanks to donations from a wealthy Protestant man named Nicholas Wadham. Cook was accepted into college at the age of 14, and studied an intense curriculum consisting of rhetoric, logic, and moral philosophy, as well as learning Latin and Greek. With assistance from Nicholas Wadham, Cook pressed on in his studies to become a lawyer at Gray's Inn. Here, Cook studied under men such as Richard Sibbs, who taught that the law is no respecter of persons. Whether a noble or a commoner, all men were liable for their crimes. This idea would deeply impact Cook's worldview. Sibbs wrote that, of all the men in hell, the torment of great men is the most, because they had the most comfort in this world. Mighty men shall be mightily tormented. That is all the privilege they shall have in hell. The curriculum was an arduous seven-year-long process, but by the end, Cook was a fully qualified lawyer and ready to practice. While Cook began practicing as a lawyer, King James was succeeded by his self-indulgent son, Charles I. He spent his days locked away in various splendid halls, living lavishly and promptly ignoring any calls for reform. Back in 1215, English barons revolted against King John and implemented what is called Magna Carta, a legal document which formed the backbone of the English common law. Most importantly, Magna Carta guaranteed certain legal norms and rights, and importantly, that the king could only raise taxes through the consent of parliament. This allowed for a power share dynamic between parliament and the king. But Charles had no interest in sharing power whatsoever. He dismissed Parliament in 1629 and ruled without their input. He raised revenue through devious means, such as unfair fines, selling monopolies and titles, and erecting custom duties. For 11 years, Parliament sat on the bench while Charles ruled the country as his own. By November of 1641, Parliament passed what is known as the Grand Remonstrance, a list of grievances against the king and his conduct during what was called his personal reign. On top of passing this damning indictment of Charles' reign, five members of Parliament were suspected by Charles to have colluded with Scottish invaders. When the King arrived to arrest the five members of Parliament he suspected in 1642, he was rebuffed by the rest of Parliament, who refused to disclose where their comrades had escaped to. Charles left London furiously and began to raise an army to stamp out the rebellious Parliament that he had always hated. The English Civil War had begun. Charles' preferred outcomes in the conflict were quite simple crush Parliament and continue ruling the way he had before. The parliamentarians had a much less cohesive view of what they wished to achieve. 
None imagined England without a king. Their plan was to defeat Charles and put him back on the throne, albeit with limited powers. They were fighting a man they wished to reinstall as the head of state. The Earl of Manchester has an excellent point which explains the bizarre nature of Parliament's war against the king. He stated that, The king need not care how often he fights. If we fight a hundred times and beat him ninety-nine, he will be king still. But if he beats us once, or the last time, we shall be hanged. We shall lose our estates and our posterities be undone. The subsequent civil war was one of the most gruelling and miserable conflicts the English people had ever seen. Estimates of total casualties are varied, but some believe that 1 in 10 Englishmen were killed in the conflict, a higher proportion than World War I based on the population at the time. But by 1646, after four years of the conflict, the war was brought to a close thanks to the enigmatic leadership of Oliver Cromwell, and the reorganised parliamentarian army, dubbed the New Model Army, was much more professionalised and a modern fighting force. But this was not the end of civil strife. Charles is imprisoned in something akin to house arrest, but in a castle with servants and all kinds of luxuries. He spent his time scheming while the parliamentarians squabbled amongst themselves over what kind of deal they would reach with him. By 1648, he convinced the Scottish to invade England and reinstall him on the throne, while royalist forces rebelled internally. The Scottish invasion and royalist riots were quelled by Parliament's new model army, and once again, Charles is imprisoned. By now, it was becoming obvious that Parliament could no longer tolerate a king, who would not only lead his nation into civil war twice, but even invite foreign forces to subdue his own subjects. We've almost forgotten about the subject of today's episode, John Cook. So what was he doing while civil war engulfed England? Cook did not take part directly in the war, however he published pamphlets supporting the parliamentary cause. In his political pamphlets, he rallied along the radicals of his day, arguing for religious tolerance, stating that the sword has no capacity to settle religion. In another pamphlet, Cook argued against the idea of forming government based on divinely ordained rule. Instead, Cook articulated, akin to Locke, that all men were born free and that government can only legitimately be established through consent. The legal system of Cook's day was rife with arbitrariness, abuse and corruption. Lawyers themselves engaged in dubious practices. Nepotism and favouritism were rife in a system that did not promote merit, but instead currying favour with powerful friends. Important legal positions in the government were often up for sale to the highest bidder. The law was also wholly inaccessible to the layperson. Statutes and reports were written in archaic Norman French, meaning unless a person was well educated and had time to learn a foreign language, they would barely understand the legal decisions that affected them. The law was also not equal. Those of status and wealth often avoided the gruesome punishments which were reserved to the poor. Those who were educated had a get out of jail free card on their first penalty. This was known as the benefit of the clergy. And justice was slow. This meant that legal fees were racked up in cases that stretched on seemingly endlessly. Cook, a lover of fairness, was horrified by the gross injustices perpetuated throughout the legal system, and he penned The Vindication of the Professors and the Profession of Law, an attack upon the injustices which plague the system. Controversially, Cook argued that lawyers ought not to earn above a certain amount. Their profession was about justice, not money. Cook even urged lawyers to waive fees for the poor, as we the protection of the law should extend to everyone, regardless of their wealth. Cook condemned the benefit of the clergy, and even argued that those who were educated, breaking the law is worse because they do not have the excuse of ignorance. A legal system that favoured some over others was anathema to reason itself. Having experienced the difficulties of a slow justice system himself over a case involving his family, Cook knew that a speedy legal system would be better for everyone. Vindications was a damning indictment of the justice system, but it was also a vision of what the law could be in the future, a speedy, equal and fair system presided over by those of merit and integrity. Men such as Cook who were in short supply. From what we have learned about Cook, it is no surprise he was nicknamed White Cook, both for his adherence to keeping his conscience pure and possibly his pasty complexion. He was a deeply pious man, and in his personal letters he discusses his faith in God planning all things for a greater purpose. Cook's greater purpose was just around the corner in January of 1649. This is when we come to the drama of Cook's life. In 1649, Charles is imprisoned yet again for trying to start a second civil war. Parliament could no longer install Charles as a monarch with limited powers. He had proven time and time again he was an untrustworthy and devious person who would do anything to see himself back in power. The easy solution was to kill Charles, poison his food or kill him during one of his many botched escape attempts. But the war Parliament had waged was but upholding Magna Carta and a commitment to the law over the will of kings, lex before rex. Revenge was not legitimate, justice was. 
Parliament committed to putting the king on trial for his crimes against the English people, an unprecedented affair. When this was announced, most lawyers in London fled. A head of state had never been held accountable for their crimes. Taking part in a king's trial was a dangerous endeavour. If the new English Republic failed, those who took part in the trial against the king would surely face retributions for treason. And the punishment for treason was well known. Hanging, drawing, and quartering. A barbaric execution where the condemned were hung and their entrails were cut out and burned in front of their eyes. After the punisher died, the body would be cut up and displayed throughout the country. So it is no surprise that most lawyers did not want to touch this monumental case with a 10-foot barge pole, lest their guts be displayed in public. Being one of the few legal minds who stayed, Cook was appointed as Solicitor General. He was in charge of controlling evidence and writing legal arguments, but he would not have a leading part in the trial. Prosecution was to be headed by Matthew Steele, who would be the face of the trial. However, by divine providence, or divine cowardice, Steele claimed to be ill and Cook was promoted to fill the position. Cook would now sign the charge against the king and read it aloud in Westminster. It was upon his shoulders to show that neither divine right or sovereign immunity as head of state would save a leader from facing his punishment. The trial began in earnest on the 20th of January, a mere 10 days after Cook's ad hoc promotion. The halls of Westminster were packed with people. As the largest hall in the country, being over 300 feet long, it was the perfect place to stress the public nature of the trial. There were not to be any shady, underhanded tactics. Justice was to be done in the light. But this ideal presented problems. Many were still ardently loyal to the king and were willing to do anything to stop this trial. The president of the court, John Bradshaw, even had his cap lined with lead to stop a bullet and wore armor beneath his lawyer's robes in case an assassin attacked, as his wife advised him to. With everything in place, the trial could begin. Charles took his place in front of the specially appointed group of judges. He was dressed like a king, covered in black silk and the Medal of St. George, walking with a silver-tipped cane. The heavily armored Bradshaw opened up the proceedings with a speech on why everyone had gathered today. After Bradshaw's speech was over, Cook stood to read the charge, and as he did, he felt a tap on his shoulder from Charles's cane. Charles told him to hold. As he began to read again, Charles tapped him again, saying, Hold. Cook took no notice, but got reading a second time. A furious Charles smacked Cook with his cane so hard that it dislodged the beautifully crafted silver tip. The tip fell to the floor, and the king beckoned for Cook to stoop down and pick up his jewellery. Instead, Cook looked the king directly in the eyes and read the charge aloud, which in its final paragraph read, And the said John Cook, on behalf of the people of England, does for the said treasons and crimes impeach the said Charles Stuart as a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and a public implacable enemy of the Commonwealth of England. As Cook read aloud the charge, the king knelt to the floor and picked up his cane's tip. The symbolism was not lost upon commentators. For the first time, Cook, the son of a farmer, had made a king bow to the laws of men. When called upon to plead guilty or not guilty, the petulant king played his gambit. He asked, I would know by what powers I am called hither. In effect, he denied the legitimacy of the court and refused to recognize them as a legal body. The second day of the trial played out much in the same manner. Charles the state time and time again, a king cannot be tried by any superior jurisdiction on the earth. Charles believed that this would put a spanner in the works and eventually give him some time to plan a scheme. But he made a massive blunder. After the second day of the trial, he was talking to his escorts quite candidly laughing that he felt no guilt for any of the deaths that occurred during the Civil War, bar one. This was immediately reported to the perturbed Cook, who began to see that the king could not be reasoned with. On the third day, Cook, enraged by the king's blasé attitude towards dealing with the dead, sprung up and made his own gambit. He explained that if a prisoner does not plead, it must be taken as an implicit confession of his own guilt, what is called a pro-confessio. Charles was given yet another chance to plead, in which he decided again to attack the legitimacy of the court, and with that, the king's fate was sealed. Many judges were uneasy with prosecuting the king on grounds of a pro-confessio or implicit confession. And to satiate their consciences, Cook called for evidentiary sessions where he rattled off the endless war crimes trials had committed during the war, including torturing prisoners, pillaging innocents, and secret conspiracies patched together through intercepted letters. Charles was to be executed. Few had thought it would come to this. Many had entered the trial hoping for a more peaceful solution. But Charles, not recognizing the court and his blasé attitude for the dead, sealed his own fate. 
Charles was executed by beheading on January 30th, 1649. Cook never got to use his hastily written but magnanimous prosecution against the king. But thankfully, Cook published what he would have written, what he entitled King Charles, His Case, published merely a week after the king had been beheaded. Cook's argument is a mixture of political, legal, and moral reasoning, all organized to make one emphatic point. Tyrants should never live with impunity after their reign has ended. Cook's legal argument centers around the fact that the atrocities perpetuated during the Civil War were under the direct command of Charles, giving what is now known in war crime trials as command responsibility. Cook explains that, He that does not hinder the doing of evil, if it lies in his power to prevent it, is guilty of a commander thereof. Moving towards a political argument, Cook begins to state that the position of the king is not a person, but instead an office. Kings are not ordained by God, but instead chosen by people, because all power is now derived from and conferred by the people. Kings are entrusted by the people to uphold the law and defend their rights. Many parliamentarians argued that if a king breached his duties, he was liable to be deposed by the people. But Cook takes this a step further. Since the king is an office created by the consent of the people, they can withdraw their consent and depose the king, or even abolish the monarchy at any time they want. Lastly, Cook employs the moral argument against tyranny. He argues about natural law, which in his words, written in every rational man's heart with the pen of diamond, that when a person is entrusted with the preservation of a people's liberties and rights, and when he betrays their trust and becomes an enemy of the people, they deserve severe punishment. He explains that the law of God and the law of nature, written in the fleshy tablets of men's hearts, states that, if the king become a tyrant, he shall die for it. England was declared a republic, and monarchy was formally abolished. Sadly, this is not the end of the story. It's not a happy ending. The new republic, ironically, was kept afloat by the de facto monarch Oliver Cromwell. The Commonwealth, headed by no monarch, only lasted a meagre 11 years before the king's son Charles II was reinstated. Monarchy firmly re-entrenched itself in English life yet again, and the republic became a memory. There are a variety of factors that could explain the fall of the English Republic, but what I believe is most important is the ideological aspect. Charles I maintained to the very end he was an innocent man who did no wrong. He played the part of the martyr to perfection. Surprisingly, many English people still had favourable opinions of the monarchy. After all, they knew little else of the alternatives. It is also difficult to dislocate hundreds of years of propaganda from people's minds. And when the replacement for monarchy had caused so much chaos, people started to think, Maybe it's just better to grin and bear it with a monarch presiding over everything. Simply put, liberty is difficult. When Charles II returned in 1660, he introduced a general pardon to stop any more bloodletting. Except, of course, those who had prominent roles in the death of his father, Charles I. Cook was quickly apprehended and kept in prison for four months. The trial of Cook was deeply unfair, with a packed jury and ever-changing laws. Despite all this, Cook defended himself admirably by arguing he had no choice in the matter. Lawyers have to accept the cases given to them, regardless of the damage it might do to their reputation or finances. This is a principle we today call the cab rank rule. Akin to taxi drivers, lawyers do not choose who they serve. They simply serve who is first in line. Cook was condemned to hanging, drawing and quartering, the punishment for treason. Despite the gruesome end that awaited him, Cook's undying faith kept him calm and collected. When his wife was allowed to visit him before the execution, she cried loudly for her husband. Cook held her and replied, Let us not part in a shower. In heaven all tears shall be wiped from our eyes. Cook died, but he never renounced his heartfelt belief that he had done the right thing. In a letter he wrote while imprisoned, he said that he was dedicated to that noble principle of preferring the universality before particularity, applying laws to all people equally, be they paupers or kings. This might seem like a hopeless ending, but history vindicated men like Cook's sacrifice. Parliament asserted itself and was never suppressed again. Charles II's son was driven from England when attempting to revive the absolutist policies of his father in 1688. This came to be known as the Glorious Revolution, and it established the English Bill of Rights, which eventually inspired the American Bill of Rights. This all couldn't have been established without the King's trial. The trial set a precedent of utmost respect for legal principles and upholding the contract between ruler and subject. The trial of Charles in 1649 deified the rule of law as the greatest jewel of the English people. 
Cook has been hard done by history. Few books delve further into his life besides a quick mention of his name while discussing the trial. It is a great tragedy that Cook has been relegated to obscurity. Few have ended tyrants' reigns, even fewer have brought them to justice. And in this regard, Cook set an important precedent. No matter how high a person may be, the law is above them, even a king. Thanks to the precedent set by Cook, criminals such as Saddam Hussein and Slobodan Milosevic were brought to justice for their wrongdoings. When Cook entered Oxford, his status was recorded as a plebeian. But this plebeian was an admirable legal reformer, a genius legal mind, and the first person to prosecute a head of state. Overall, not a bad performance for a plebeian. Thanks a for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you may listen to podcasts. Visit the website www.libertarianism.org to find more podcasts like this one. I hope to see you next time.